Well, welcome to the 700 Club. A terrible decision for America and for Israel. The fallout continues from the U.S. Fa failure to veto a U.N. Security Council resolution for an immediate ceasefire. The failure helps Hamas, hurts the hostages, and will likely lengthen the war. Well, defense chiefs from Israel and the U.S. met in Washington yesterday, and they remain deadlocked over Israel's plan to invade Rafah and defeat Hamas. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin pressed Israel's defense minister to make guarding the civilian population of Gaza a top priority. Protecting Palestinian civilians from harm is both a moral necessity and a strategic imperative. In Gaza today, the number of civilian casualties is far too high, and the amount of humanitarian aid is far too low. He also told Yoav Gallant that Israel can defeat Hamas without invading Rafah, where more than a million refugees from the war are holed up. Gallant insists Israel must go after Hamas and Rafah to wipe out the terror group's last military battalions and to retrieve the hostages, and he called for the U.S. to stand by their side. The negotiation on the hostages issue and Hamas positions require us to join hands in, the, in our military and diplomatic uh, efforts. Israel's prime minister says the Jewish nation will invade Rafah with or without U.S. help. Benjamin Netanyahu is still fuming over America's decision not to veto Monday's U.N. Security Council vote, demanding a ceasefire in Gaza, but not linking it to the release of the hostages. Well-known Jewish attorney Alan Dershowitz told an Israeli channel that decision will have consequences on the ground in Israel and in the fall elections in the U.S. It will lengthen the war. It will make it more difficult for Israel. It is a terrible decision for America. It's a terrible decision for Israel. And it will drive a great many Jewish Democrats like me away from voting for the Biden administration. Critics say the decision strengthens Hamas in hostage negotiations after Hamas refused to give up the hostages unless Israel agrees to stop the war, the Israeli delegation walked out. On Tuesday, the New York Times published the first released hostage testimony of sexual abuse. Amit Susana testified that her captor sexually violated her repeatedly. This is an horrific testimony. This is a wake up a wake-up call to the world to act, to do everything, and pressure Hamas to free our hostages. 130 hostages remain in Hamas captivity, many of them women. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. It's like the world's been turned upside down where they're condemning the wrong party. To condemn Israel in this makes no sense to me at all. All of the pressure should be on Hamas. They're the ones who started this. They're the ones who invaded Israel. The IDF wasn't in Gaza. Israel didn't control Gaza. Hamas controlled Gaza. And, and all of the suffering there is because of what Hamas is doing and has been doing, diverting all the international aid into military uh, action, whether it's building rockets or tunnels. All of the, the money, and it's been millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars going into that. The IDF is, is an unusual military where they announce in advance what they're going to do, and they tell civilians to move out of the way. There was a hospital that was a shelter for Hamas fighters. They captured 650. That is an incredible number. 650 Hamas fighters trying to hide in a hospital, both underground and within the hospital complex. In that action, not a single doctor, not a single nurse, none of the medical personnel were harmed at all. That shows the care that the IDF is, is bringing to this. If you want to see peace in Gaza, if you want to protect the civilians of Gaza, the number one thing we need to do is to tell Hamas to surrender, to release the hostages, to lay down their arms and submit to the IDF. If they do that, there will be peace today. 
and the civilians will be saved. If they don't do that, Israel has every right of self-defense to say, Hamas, you can't exist anymore. You have pledged to fight us again and again. You have pledged to repeat October 7 again and again and again. We can't allow that. You can't exist anymore. The international community needs to wake up to this threat and support Israel. And please call your congressman. Please call your senator. Let them know how you feel. Now more than ever, we have to stand with Israel. Well, in other news, quick action on the ground saved countless lives when the Baltimore Bridge collapsed yesterday. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. Tragically, those six construction workers are presumed dead after they fell into the water when the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed early Tuesday morning. CBN's Wendy Griffith has more on that cargo ship that hit the bridge and the quick response that prevented more deaths. Wednesday morning, the Coast Guard called off its search and rescue for the six missing people, saying it was too dangerous for their divers to be in the water. We do not believe that we're going to find any of these individuals still alive. The six people were part of a construction crew repairing potholes on the Francis Scott Key Bridge at the time it was struck. Another worker survived but is in serious condition. Maryland Governor Wes Moore met and prayed with families of the victims. We've had a chance to spend time earlier today with the, uh, with the families and um, they're remarkable. They're, uh, they're prayerful people, and we had the chance to pray with them. We had a chance to pray for them, and, um, and we want to let them know that, uh, that we are going to keep on praying for them, and not just us, but they have got 6.3 million people, and they've got a whole country and a whole world who's, uh, who's praying for their peace. Moments before the collision, it appears black smoke was rising from the ship as the lights on board went out. Hold on, traffic on the key bridge. Uh, there's a ship approaching that just lost their steering. Officials on the ground stopped traffic on the bridge when the crew on board notified authorities they lost power, saving countless lives. There was a Mayday who literally, by being able to stop cars from coming over the bridge, uh, these people are heroes. The NTSB says the ship called Dally is nearly 1,000 feet long, weighing 95,000 tons. An inspection in June 2023 found issues with its propulsion and auxiliary machinery. Investigators are planning to go on board the ship as early as today. I do not know of a bridge that has been constructed to withstand a direct impact from a vessel of this size. President Biden pledged federal funds to rebuild the bridge and reopen the port of Baltimore. Meanwhile, ocean carriers are being diverted to the port of Virginia to keep trade moving. The collapse expected to have a serious impact on global supply chains and could cost up to $15 million a day in lost economic activity. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. Thank you, Wendy. The pro-life debate returned yesterday to the Supreme Court. The justices heard arguments on whether the FDA should reinstate safety regulations on an abortion pill. But those cautions lifted after the agency made mifepristone available by mail. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson has the details. Hundreds of demonstrators gathered in front of the U.S. Supreme Court building, eager to make their voices heard, some hoping the justices rule against those who want to limit access to the abortion pill. Their argument that, oh, it's dangerous for the woman is absolutely incorrect scientifically. Others think mifepristone, now used in two-thirds of all abortions, is unsafe and too widely available. The clinic had told me they pressured chemical abortion and said that it would be easier than surgical abortion, but that wasn't true. That was a lie. Outside the Supreme Court, CBN's Tara Mergener points to the last time we saw similar demonstrations. This case comes less than two years after the court relinquished federal oversight of abortion rights, leaving the issue to individual states and their legislatures. Inside the courthouse, while the FDA argues removing doctor's visits to get the abortion pill isn't dangerous, Justice Alito questioned the safety of removing all three. Isn't that obvious that three things that 
may be innocuous or not excessively dangerous if engaged in by themselves may become very dangerous when they're all done together. And why shouldn't the FDA have addressed that? The attorney for a group of pro-life doctors pointed out that the FDA itself admitted the drugs harm a significant number of women. The FDA concedes that between 2.9 and 4.6 percent of women will end up in the emergency room. The FDA acknowledges that women are even more likely to need surgical intervention and other medical care without an in-person visit. Even so, some justices appeared to give the FDA more weight when it comes to certain decisions. The reality is, even if there is some increase in emergency room visits, the question of when that rises to a sufficient safety risk is up to the FDA, correct? The attorney countered that the FDA behaved recklessly by removing safeguards, which can put doctors in the position of unwillingly taking part in abortions. FDA's outsourcing of abortion drug harm to respondent doctors forces them to choose between helping a woman with a life-threatening condition and violating their conscience. As to the doctor's conscience concerns, Justice Jackson questioned whether that would warrant limiting the availability of mifepristone. Do we have to also entertain your argument that no one else in the world can have this drug or no one else in America uh, should have this drug in order to protect your clients? While the justices did seem to consider safety issues associated with mifepristone, many comments focused on the issue of standing, that is, whether the pro-life doctors have been or will be sufficiently harmed. The high court is expected to announce its decision in June. Lori Johnson, CBN News. All right, thank you, Lori, and all eyes will be watching. Gordon? Yes, they will. I commented yesterday we need to be concerned about the health of women. If, the, if this drug leads to 1 in 20 being admitted to an emergency room, uh, that it obviously raises safety concerns. But after yesterday's oral argument, uh, the Supreme Court has sort of two easy outs here where they don't have to decide the case on the merits. Was it proper for the FDA to do this? They can say, well, you don't have standing to bring this case, and that would be, uh, I guess, the easiest way. Uh, the second is it's not up to the courts to second-guess the FDA. Uh, there's the legislative branch and the administration branch that, that ought to swing into action if the FDA does that kind of thing. And is it up to the court system? Uh, particularly when they're not dealing with an injured patient. So uh, this is very complicated legal arguments. There's obviously politics involved. We'll see the decision in June.